Thank you for taking the time to listen to Pastor Eddie's Bible study. Due to the nature of the discussion, he would ask that you would listen to all his answers and responses to each statement and question that has been asked. Now I want to do something before we uh, do our J dollars tonight. I want to try something and then go to the Lord in prayer and then do our J dollars. Uh, Fran, can I get you and Larry to pass these out? Uh, I've got 75 of them, so probably just about one for everybody or one per couple. And this is something there's no definite proof of, but I have read about this before in uh, the history of the church, that the 12 days of Christmas, do you remember on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me, that that actually was written as symbols of the early church. Now, there's no definite proof going way back that it was, but they said they had to use certain symbols because of the terrible, terrible persecution. And so this is a rendition of that that talks about each of them and what the symbols are. And I just thought that would be kind of neat. You may already know it. uh, So you might look at that. And uh, we're going to start with the 12th day of Christmas and we're all going to sing it here in just a minute. And uh, so and then we're going to do the actual 12 days of Christmas, not what they symbolize. But as you're looking at that sheet for a moment there, the idea would be like two turtle doves are for the Old and New Testament Three French hens stand for faith, hope, and love. They're just symbols. And I've read different versions of this over the years. So there's probably something of fact to it. But whether it really dates back to the concept of the persecution and they had to have symbols uh, to get the message of Christ out, there's just no way of knowing anything about that. But I thought you might like this as a keepsake if you don't have it, okay? Now, I don't have this underlined. I used to sing this to my little girls a couple years ago, but I always had trouble. Let's see, there's the 11, let's see here, the 10, and the 9, ladies. I'm doing this so I can help lead you there. 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. What's the 8? Oh, my goodness, where's the 8 at? 8 maids. Milking seven swans, swimming six geese, five golden ring, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> All righty, let's do this and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to do our J dollars. Thank you, Fran, so very much. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Twelve drummers drumming, eleven pipers piping, ten lords leaping, nine ladies dancing, eight maids a milking, seven swans a swimming, six geese a laying, five golden rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> Lord, we love you so much tonight. We thank you for the Christmas season. We thank you for the opportunity to rejoice and love the Lord. For Epiphany, our uh, service tomorrow night deals with the wise men coming, and that's very much a part of the Christmas season. The Gentiles from afar worshiping the baby Jesus, following the star. That's such a beautiful concept. Lord, tonight we go to, the, to you in prayer for Pastor Bob for Brother Tom Eldridge. We're just asking for your holy touch on both of them and on their families that you would wrap your loving arms around them. Probably each of us in here has a family member or friend that has just not been doing well over the Christmas holidays or Christmas season. Father, right now, corporately, together, we just pray for them all, your individual needs. We lift them up to the Lord Jesus Christ, your blessings. Father, be with our SPRC tonight, uh, Roxanne, as she rotates off, and uh, our new folks. I think we have about five new members tonight. Lord, just bless them. This is a tremendous ministry within our church, Father, and we thank you for those that are willing to serve on that great committee, to work with our staff, and our staff works, as we said Sunday, with all the volunteers. Father, we give you praise and glory. And may all of God's children say... Two Sundays in a row, we asked you to bless your staff. I was able to give our 10 staff each a, little, a check a little over $200 a piece because of your offering. That's $2,000. 
that the church gave. We do that every year, and that's about what it averages. Actually, that's a little higher than what we've had the last couple of years. Started again by Chaplain Dinkins a number of years ago, uh, just to, to show them that we love them. And it, they symbolize all of us. So it was a wonderful, wonderful meeting there. Let's look at our Jesus dollar. Somebody gave me Fran one uh, Sunday, and they said, make sure you put it in there. So I've got one right here, an actual J dollar. You're welcome. All right. Remember, this goes to our homeless ministry. I've seen a number of you been signing up for them. John, what you got? I've got a uh, counterfeit dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> this, if you feel, you, there's right here, it's smooth. Uh-huh. A, a regular dollar bill, you can feel ripples. There. Oh, my goodness gracious. I had 80 of them. John had 80 of these counterfeit dollars. Oh. Only one was, oh good, better, I was going to ask you if your printing press is still running. I can feel it. I, you know, John, I, you're right. That really is. You can feel the difference. And actually, old George doesn't look quite the same. There's just a little something. Something doesn't look right. He cr- That's for you. <laughs> Seriously? I have never had a counterfeit dollar. You know, I got uh, from an evangelist years ago. He said, take this dollar bill. He sent me, put it in your wallet, and it'll bless you. John, see if I can put this in here and see if it'll bless me, this counterfeit. (laughs) What's that, Linda? I bet you end up in jail. Yeah, I'll probably end up passing it. I better take it out of my wallet. That would be terrible. Front page of the Riverland News. (laughs) I'm innocent. John gave it to me. What you got there, friend? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we have left, right, and center. Hey. They have threatened to take yep. me to Gamblers Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> we have wrote down our forgiveness. We're praying for you, friend. Your dollars. Give us your Jesus dollars. Remember again tonight... Um, Remember, remember, uh, I've forgotten what I was going to ask you to remember. <laughs> oh, a number of you have been signing up back there. I mentioned last week that because the girls are in a, uh, we're taking them to a special place on Fridays. Uh, we can't, uh, can't take the homeless dinner right now. So a number of you have stepped up and been signing up for that. And uh, so I just praise the Lord for that. And so others, the sign-up sheet's back there. Remember that we'd be glad to encourage you to to find out how to do it. Those folks at Sam's getting to know us so well up there. I've talked to the ones that do the cooking of the chicken a number of times now, and they're just great people, great people. Praise the Lord. Oh, here's the envelope here. They just, uh, Rochelle left this, friend. I don't know. I don't see the envelope with this thing. It says J dollars. Okay. What do we got? You've got to read this. Read this one here. Right, righteous, left, Lord, C for center, Christ, G, Gamble (laughs) for God equals God. All right, I can gamble on God. I like that. That sounds like a lock, doesn't it? When you turn in the opening up a safe, that sounds that way. Pran, you know more about this stuff than maybe you should. I don't know about that. I don't know. She'll count up our dollars here. We're going to remember again prayers for our SBRC meeting tonight. And uh, uh, that again is over all the staff we have. There are actually over 10 staff that's on the back of your bulletin every Sunday. We really have a number of folks that we, we give stipends to to help. For instance, in the youth department, uh, Harmony Preschool's got zillions of people that they give stipends to. Uh, the band. We have a stipend for uh, three of those, and I'll tell you, one of, uh, two of the young men were at uh, Meadowbrook Live. Some of you have been over there to see that. I think Dale and Mitch Toomey, he did, and uh, they bring in some professionals to sing, and our drummer and uh, the Carlos that directs the praise team uh, was performing there. They are uh, off the charts. They're amazing. So that was just kind of neat that we had somebody representing us over there and helping to lead in worship. They are there having thousands of people at each of the services, you know. So maybe someday that'll be with us. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. I want you to turn tonight. I got three things. I doubt if we'll get this far, but I would love for us to touch on them if we can. We're back in the book of Acts. Remember that uh, the last couple of months we've been trying to work through the the early church forming, talking about how our church wants to grow and expand. No better thing to do than to study the early church and see how they 
did it. Uh, It never grows old, and we can learn so much from them. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 17, starting with verse 16 tonight. Uh, We've not even read this yet. The last couple weeks we've been backing up, uh, trying to make sure women knew where their place was. Amen. (laughs) We'll touch on that again. Not tonight, though. Not tonight. I've got three things I want us to lift up tonight again, and we may only get to the first one, but the first one I wanted us to lift up, and I left you with this last week if you were here, is can a devout Muslim go to heaven? Okay, that was, that's how we left the message, and a couple of you wanted to talk uh, and give us your view last week, and I had to say, shush, just like the angel Gabriel had to do to Zechariah. Uh, so uh, we're going to start off with that after we read the text, and then also the second one, if we get that far, is um, do you have the gift of the Holy Spirit, and what gift do you have? And we want to look from the passage. Paul was a tent maker, so he went back using his original skills. You have skills. You have, you have talents, difference between a talent and a spiritual gift. And I thought it would be good to jump over into Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, and look at that for a moment, and then Ephesians 4, about some of the spiritual gifts that are lifted up. And I don't know, like I said, how far we're going to get tonight, especially with needing to end right at the 7 o'clock hour because of our uh, staff parish relations committee meeting. And then the third one I want us to look at uh, is the concept, if you'll look, and let me go ahead and show it to you so you might study ahead for us, the very last part of chapter 18 And if you look at verse 24, let me just go ahead and read this to you. And this, like I said, we probably won't get this far tonight, but I think it's going to be a great discussion. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, who was a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man and had thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been, verse 25, instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. And I, I'd like to discuss what actually is the, the, the only understood the baptism of John. What's the difference between that and being a Christian, being filled with the Spirit? So uh, I don't know if we'll get that far tonight, probably not, but that's going to be the three topics that we're going to lift up over the next couple of weeks. So let's begin with where we left off last week, Acts chapter 17, if you'll thumb back again, verse 16, Paul is now in Athens, and there's a word here. I'll get Brother Steve to help me out. I don't know if I can pronounce it correctly in a moment um, of the leadership of those, of those smart people back then um, in that area of Greece. So let's just read through this, through the whole chapter, and then begin to discuss about other faiths and other people's understandings about salvation. Verse 16, uh, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with them. Now hold there for a minute, keep your finger there. My study Bible, somebody asked me about this. These study Bibles are fantastic. I hope every one of you gets one if you don't have one. Maybe a good one for Christmas. Uh, They always define these different terms. And mine says, the Epicureans were disciples of Epicurus who lived from 341 to 270 B.C. who abandoned as hopeless the search by reason for pure truth, seeking instead pleasure through experience. And then it goes on explaining more. Then it goes on to describing the Stoic philosophers being just almost the opposite. You know, and you probably heard that term so much, you know, that's a very Stoic person, you know, Uh, would not be a free willing uh, person just, you know, going on feelings and so forth. So you have the two extremes in this environment where Paul is talking, verse 18. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the... Steve, how do you say that? Ari, Ari, Areopagus, Areopagus. Y'all say that with me, Areopagus, okay? 
So he, then he took him and brought him to a meeting of the? Thank you. Where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. Verse 21, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Now, some of you would love an environment like that. Some of the rest of you would think that's the worst thing in the world, okay? Well, let's go ahead and finish the chapter. Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. Boy, he's such a good, uh, uh, he's good. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of the heaven and the earth, does not live in temples built by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him, find him, though he is not far from each of us. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. Verse 30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now... He commands all people everywhere to repent. And remember, repent means change direction. Verse 31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him, that man, from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject at that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Didymus, the member of the? Also, a woman named Demarius, or Demaris, and a number of others. The Word of God for the people of God. Now, when I studied this, and I know you can go in a variety of ways, and we'll pass the microphone around in a minute, just a reminder that if you're on the mic, good chances are you'll be on the web the following week. We had difficulties. Rochelle called me uh, earlier today and said she had trouble. She just couldn't get it up this last week. But normally the Bible study's on there, so your voice, if you use the microphone, will be on the web, or at least that's our intention. You could go a variety of places here. Um, we're in the study. Uh, you could talk about the Stoics, the Epicureans, talk about uh, those with the, the Greek philosophers, the, where the Apostle Paul's going, and uh, the idea, he is so creative. I mean, he knows a way to give a zinger, you know, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them against idols. But the one I, I want to at least look at some uh, tonight and, and see if any of you have an answer to that uh, would be the concept about a devout religious person. And I said last week, like a Muslim, but it could be of any religion. And, I, and please understand, when I say other religions, I don't mean other Christian faiths, like Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal. Many people use that as synonyms, and, I, and that's not correct. When you say another religion, that, you, know, you say, oh, I, I, I'm not a Methodist, I'm another religion, I'm a Baptist. That's, you're, you're a Christian, and the Christian is one religion. That's, that's different than Buddhist or, or you know, uh, Islam or something of that sort. So, I mean, we're, we're from different backgrounds within the Christian faith. But what about other faith walks is what I'm talking about tonight. You know, and they're devout in their faith walks. Uh, even Judaism that does not represent Jesus. Not a Messianic Jew, but a Jew Orthodox that still holds the Old Testament, looks for the Messiah, and does not believe it is Jesus. So I'm, I'm putting that in there too. All these others, you know, how does a person truly get saved? How does a person truly go to heaven? I mean, are there scripture verses 
that, that show those things. And to open up the discussion tonight, Fran has the uh, microphone. Irene sent me a text, and I loved it. Irene, are you here tonight? Okay, I, do you mind if I read this? Good, I was going to read it anyway. That's okay. Uh, let me get Irene on my phone here. She sent this from a reading she had read, and she sent it to me last week, and I thought it was excellent. Uh, Irene says, I have been reading a book by Nabel Qureshi, uh, and this is what it says, No God but one. He states that God is a relational God. What God, what makes our Christian God different from the Muslim God is the relationship. It only makes sense when you realize the true God is made up of three. It is how God can be in us as the Holy Spirit while being over us as the Father and suffering for us as the Son. He explains that as a God of compassion and mercy, He must have, at the very beginning, had to have someone to have compassion for and mercy with. Therefore, he could not have been alone at the beginning, but he was three in one, the triune God. I thought that was a neat way of, of looking at that concept. Now, I wanted to open up our discussion with that. Um, what about a devout Muslim or someone of another faith? I'm just using that as an example. Do you think that they get a chance to go to heaven if they don't know Jesus, obviously, the way you and I know Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Do we have any scriptural references, any thoughts? Wave your hand right there. Doc? Yeah. <clears throat> in John three eighteen, it mm -hmm. says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already, already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Good, good. And we all know John, two verses before, John three sixteen, right? Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That seems pretty black and white, right? What do you got, Ray? Uh, you was talking about three and one and him being by himself well mm -hmm. that didn't last very long because he had to have some company yes so he gave adam uh, to him and he had adam for a while and then he said he he, he, he needed some company so he gave her eve so therefore he wasn't by himself okay well i think all of those that's what this author is saying too ray that the symbolism of relationships proves that god has always been in relationship with himself the trinity as well as with us with others also yeah john I am a Christian, and uh, I, in faith, I believe that Jesus is truly my Lord and Savior. Right. And any Muslim or any Buddhist that accepts in faith Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, right. they can be saved, yes. just like I am saved. Okay. So, you know, all you do is believe in the Lord's Son and accept him. Okay. And that's all you need to do to be saved. I agree wholeheartedly with what John is saying, that that is the route, the road of salvation. And everyone that believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as Dot and Ray and John have said, are going to enter into glory as saved souls. But now what about the rest of the world? Does that mean the rest of the world, if they've not done that, does that automatically mean that they're all lost? What do you think, Joe? Well, I, I think the, uh, a, a devout Muslim couldn't do that. Couldn't do... A devout Muslim, if he, he, he couldn't believe like John oh, says. Oh, oh, he, he, yeah. Once, he did, True. once he's done that, his, his devotion to and he's rebelled Muslim against, is, is gone. He's no longer a devout Muslim. So right. I, right. Well, that, I agree. That's what John is saying about right. that, that if a devout Muslim or Buddhist or even a Jew came to know Jesus, then they would repent of their other belief and they would turn to Jesus, right? Think, so they wouldn't be devout anymore for that faith. In one way or another, everyone has a confrontation. Right. With, That's kind with, of what I'm trying to head towards with, tonight. With Joe, us. how does it happen, do you think? What about the somebody Holy, far I think, away? I think the Holy Spirit deals with them. Okay. I think the Holy Spirit deals with them. I agree. In, in a way that, 
that we maybe don't understand. Exactly, and I think we need to be open to that. Yeah. The Holy Spirit has to give, we believe, everybody an equal opportunity, uh, I guess, or an equal, I don't know how to say it verbally. Well, um, otherwise, they couldn't be, they couldn't be judged uh, if they hadn't had an opportunity to say, yes, I believe, or no, I... Uh, well, they couldn't be judged in our understanding of what is just right now is God's understanding of just the same as Eddie Fulford's understanding of just I mean I don't understand why Florida State Joe is not in the national championship right. see and I think that would be just but God obviously had other sites somewhere in there you know so I wonder if God's ways are not my ways you know and again what is just in God's eyes all we have is the Bible you know to show us right uh, when I was in Nam and in- Dude, we had a little scrimmage there, and the saddest thing I ever seen was this uh, lady standing in front of Buddha, lighting a candle, crying for a little baby. Oh. If what kind of situation is that baby in, in in heaven? What 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 makes you know her religion shouldn't be judged on on him? Oh, mamas, yeah. That's a good point. Now, our basic belief, I'm not saying this is true or not, but our basic belief, there's Lorna and then Steve there, uh, Fran. Uh, Lorna, way in the back corner there. Our basic understanding, and I'm not saying, again, this is right or wrong, but in the Christian faith right now is that, you know, infants, children before they come of age, that's a good Methodist belief because that's when we do the confirmation, that they are, and just like a person that's mentally ill, or, you know, die before that period of time, they are innocent. And again, in our minds, innocent before the glory of God. Um, But Steve and I had a talk about that months ago, and uh, Steve, you might want to speak to that. But what he lifted up was, you know, if you look at it that way, those that may be mentally ill uh, or those that are infants that die, you know how many uh, uh, aborted children are? There's a whole lot, if if that part is true, then there's a whole lot of souls in heaven that we just don't even need to worry about. That, that's amazing. That, actually, that's a tremendous amount of souls if that's the way God does it, you know, in that light. So that's good. Let's do Lorna and then up to Steve here. Lorna? I was just sitting here thinking that the Bible is our holy book, the yes. Christian's mm-hmm. holy book, and the Quran is the Muslim's holy book. Right. So does the Quran say any place that the only way to heaven is through Muhammad or Well it's very clear how to enter I mean what you the steps you're supposed to take it's a very ritualistic and demanding of law and even when you die you still don't know if you've made it okay. or not were you good enough about yeah. that yet yeah, it is it is planned out they have certain rituals that they have to do certain amount of prayers and it's really built on By good works, works like yeah. a lot of religions are in that light so it is it is. But now a devout, go back to what Joe said, a devout Muslim, if you said that the only way to go to heaven is to believe in Jesus Christ and Jesus is a part of God, the triune God, a and devout Muslim would say that's ridiculous. You know, that can't be. So that person would have to really change a direction to come to that if that's the only way of salvation. And that's what we seem to be seeing, saying. Steve, what you got, guy? Can I talk for a long time? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got the SBRC meeting. Okay, so. <laughs> well, I have a lot of stuff to share. You know, a lot of Christians have a very negative perspective on how many people are saved because mm-hmm. Jesus said, you know, narrow is the gate and straight is the way that leads to eternal life, and broad is the way that leads to eternal destruction. And so that is a verse that's often used for a pessimistic view of how many make it into heaven. But right. if you look in the corresponding, that, that passage occurs in Matthew And if you look in the corresponding passage in Luke, the parallel passage, Jesus is speaking that to his generation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very clear that that is his assessment of how many of the Jews will believe and embrace him. So it's not to be taken as a generalization for all of Christian history. Um, Explain that for us again. Now, what, what part of what Jesus is saying... I missed that. Would well, he just... says in, Jap- in Luke, he quotes okay. the same words, and he says that this is true of those who are with him walking the streets of Israel. So, I mean, that's Jesus' assessment right. of the response of the Jews okay. to his ministry. Mm-hmm. It's not to be taken as, you know, Something a generalization for all, yeah. for all of time. Okay. 
Okay. And as I shared with you, and you mentioned that, you know, that if, you know, I believe there's very good reason to believe that infants dying in infancy are saved, mm -hmm. you know, and back before the age of modern medicine, infant death was very common, young children death. I mean, families would have 10 kids and lose half or more of them in infancy. So a lot of babies never make it. Um, there's a lot of miscarriages. There's many abortions. So, I mean, we're talking about a huge number huge of humanity. Number, exactly. And there's something in this passage. So, you know, I want to encourage sure. people to get rid of pessimism. Sure. sure. Uh, you know, and then a lot of people say, but what about the people that die and they've never heard the gospel that's, you know that's one question, of the questions good. that get raised you know what about the people who die they've never heard the gospel isn't that unfair okay hold right there for a minute steve a devout muslim let me just enhance that a devout muslim you and i grow up in iraq and we were raised by muslim parents and we try to be good boys good girls so we grow up in that faith and let's say we've never heard that's what steve's about to speak to never heard the name of jesus We've never heard that. Now, Joe Farley said he thinks the Holy Spirit somewhere along the line, you know, has a, a confrontation with us some way, and that's between the God and the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus and that person. But, you know, that person over here has never heard the name of Jesus. What happens to them? Injustice. That's, go ahead, Steve. Then we'll come up to you, Shirley. Go ahead, Steve. Well, in this passage that we've read, there's a very interesting verse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a number of things I want to say about this whole chapter, but I'll just focus on this uh, okay. for now. Um, in verse 26 of Acts chapter 17, he says, From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Now that was a direct smack against the Greek view of uh, non-Greeks because he, they viewed everybody that was outside of Greece as barbarians, you know, because the Greeks viewed themselves as the superior race. They were very racist oriented. Hmm. And so Paul says, no, we all came from one man. Right. And, uh, you know, and God determined the times and the seasons, the places where they lived. And of course, he's referring there to the Tower of Babel, that God divided humanity for the sake of the preservation of humanity and the suppression of evil. Uh, verse uh, twenty. Seven is really interesting. God did this so that men would seek him mm. and perhaps, literally it says, grope for him and, this is the surprise, and find him. Mm. Now he's talking about people that don't, I believe, have the gospel That's what Joe was uh, revealed to them. And, you know, we might say, They're find, seeking him you know. in their own way, they, only what they know. Well, right? I conclude from this that, you know, I'm not saying that we should stop preaching the gospel to people because you know this is I would say the flashlight way to find God versus the floodlight way of the gospel being preached to men right but do men need to necessarily know the name of Jesus in order to be saved I think from this and I'll show you another verse in scripture I'd say no to that hmm. but I think they have to repent they have to realize that they're unworthy to be saved and that's that's you know in in, in uh, talking about Humility. Islam Humility, go ahead. Yeah, in talking about Islam, Islam is a works religion. Yes. And all, all worldly religions, in contrast to Christianity, seek to get man to pull, up his bootstra pull himself up by his bootstraps and save himself by his own good works. Judaism, same yes, way. Judaism, yes, Judaism. Uh, you know, Islam is definitely very much along that line. Right. So you, have to find the, you have to follow the five pillars right. of well, Islam in order to be asking, saved. Is there steps, and there is very very strict rules yes and in the end according to islam god is going to weigh everyone's works and if your good works i'll weigh your bad works you'll probably make it but you know allah has allah is basically free to say yeah i don't think so I don't exactly think, he has i don't the, like you allah, allah is very capricious and uh and people you know islam islamic people say well allah is merciful yeah not I really. I haven't seen a whole lot of that. You know, uh, I don't see mercy in Islam. Yeah. It's Allah can be very capricious. If he doesn't like you, you're gone. Steve, we're so. going to need to stay with, that's going to be a great topic. I mean, I, you may want to add something to it, but I think we ought to discuss. Steve has just brought up that he said, I don't necessarily see that you have to repent in the name of Jesus, right? Right, but you, need, you do need to see your own. I think God through his Holy Spirit can guide people to see their unworthiness. Mm-hmm to see that they can't save themselves right. 
and to cry out to the unseen God. Okay. You know, because the Bible can just consistently condemns idolatry that uh, makes images in order to worship right. those images. And, and so that verse that you just read from the passage now, this is right out of the scriptures, is that he put men everywhere around the globe, even men that would be far away from where Jesus was even born, that they will all try to seek God, right? And so as they're trying to seek God, they will be groping, as you said, just trying to reach out to him. And your understanding is that if they uh, repent of their selfishness, of, of, uh, that they, they need God, they cannot be saved on their own, their good works, Right? that that in itself is a repentance, right? Am I, am I, I don't want to put words in your right. mouth. I, but. I think two things need to be necessary. They need to abandon, you know, uh, an idol, idolatrous, idolatrous worship, and they need to say, I'm not worthy of being saved. Okay, hold those and I, two that, right there. That guidance to that truth can only come through the Holy Spirit working in their hearts. Okay, that's what Joe would say. I want to share one more passage that oh, okay. I think is what, very significant. Now, is that going to take us away from that? Because I think this is a great topic to work on. Is no, that, I'm, okay. I'm going to follow up on this topic. Okay. And that's found in, uh, in Romans chapter 10. It says in Romans chapter 10, verses 15 and following, And how can they preach unless they are sent... And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news or the gospel. Mm -hmm. But not all the Israelites accepted the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. So he's asking the question, did mm -hmm. men hear the good news? Did they hear the gospel? And then he cites from uh, Psalms 19, but he does not cite the part of Psalm 19 that deals with special revelation or scriptural revelation. Surprisingly, he cites from the first part of the psalm, which says, their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Now, he's talking here about the gospel, and he's saying, have men heard the gospel? And he says, yes, they have. And he, in that verse, he cites nat, what we describe as natural revelation. revelation. Not special revelation of the scripture, but natural revelation. So he's saying there that the men of this world hear the gospel through natural, natural. revelation. Where, where is it in the scriptures that even creation itself, you know, magnifies, teaches, gives worship or something? I can't remember where that is. But right, it, Romans chapter 8. Okay, you know, even and, itself does that, you know. That should bring people to God, just nature, and that's what you're referring to. Yeah, I mean this. I mean, when I when I first came across this in Romans, and I studied all the commentaries on it, because in the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, it basically, and I disagree with this at that point, it says that through the light of natural revelation, God gives men enough light to condemn them, but not to save them, yeah. and that's in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And I said to myself when I looked at this, I said, wait a minute. This is a gross contradiction of that because Paul says that natural revelation teaches the gospel. Gives us so there must be, be enough light in natural revelation to save men. Okay, hold on, Steve. Well, just hold there because I mean, you, you're such a deep theologian, Steve. I mean, I know, this is, I know, the, I know that all the, and we need to dissect this. Now, what I would want first, if you'll pass the mic to Joe, would that answer your question or not? Well, you got to say it on the microphone. <laughs> yes, you see I think what I mean? it does. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, but now, if uh, your background is Nazarene, yes. So if a well, Nazarene that's very, preacher, that's very Wesleyan too. I mean, yes, sir. Well, yes, we're yes, claim yes, more yes, Wesleyan yes, than Methodist. I know, I know, I know, Joe. I'm trying to pick on you here now. Don't don't take away my thunder. So the, the, you know, <laughs> I mean, the idea if I was a Nazarene preacher, uh, you know, and I if I was Chick Shaver, if I come right. and I said, Joe. You've got to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you're telling me that there's nature itself, that if a person repents of their sin and they seek God and they do right. not turn to idols and they do not turn to their own self-sufficiency, but they, they ask God for grace and guidance, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to them. Uh, I, what about Jesus, Joe? What I, would you say? No, I, I would say that person is, hey, I think that's the Holy Spirit dealing with that would person. Would you say that that in a way is Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, it is Outside a, of the physical form, could that, what a, Steve just said, be Jesus? Remember, Jesus, only a, Jesus we know, was in the physical form. Take Jesus out of the physical form, the cosmic Christ. Take him out of the physical body, and what do you, what do you have? Well, he's I mean, the he's Holy God. Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. Right. 
Wow, that's deep stuff. Oh yeah, deep stuff here. Oh yeah. Well, let's pass it around here. Let's just let's get some. Oh, Shirley yeah. was first here, Fran. Shirley, oh, go ahead, Stephen. Then Shirley, uh, let me go to Shirley. I, I saw your hand. <laughs> Seth, I think our mic went off. Hello. There you oh. go. Yeah, I mean, it I does say in it. Acts that they grope for him, which yes. has the idea that you know, I mean, groping. If you look up that word, it means you know, feeling around Just in the dark. Find, yeah. So, I mean, we're not talking about people that have a lot of light and understanding. Is that a good situation? So I'm not trying to say, hey, we don't need to preach the gospel no. to people. No. And how many people find God through this means? Of course, we have no way of knowing. That's in God's providence. But, you know, groping is not a great place to be. Exactly. <laughs> have you exactly. ever gotten up in the middle of the night and you're groping around in the dark? It's That's a very a scary point. thing. You you're know? at the bottom of the barrel. So, you're just, yeah, yeah, you're but, just trying your best. But I, I think this answers the question that many people say, well, what about the people that never hear the gospel? You know, or Is there any hope for them? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, this opens the door to tons of people coming in that way. But God answers, I think, that question in his word. And he so. is the judge. All yes. shall face the judgment seat of Christ. So he looks at the heart. Let's go to Shirley and then back there, Holly. See what you think, Shirley, what you got. Yay or nay? Two things. Uh, somewhere, I, I wish I was a better Bible scholar, but somewhere in Revelations, mm -hmm. it says that there is a second chance. I'll have to look it up and tell you where it is. But I think the context um, of, of thought is, well, I don't know. When you said revelation, I'm trying to think where that would be. I'll have to uh, look it up and tell you. I know that when you look at those that believe like in the seven-year tribulation period, many people believe that the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the rapture concept, taking people away, that there is a second opportunity for people to come to Christ during that time before the end of the world. I know that's part of the dispensationalist understanding. Maybe yeah. that's the idea from Revelation, maybe? Maybe so. Know. I'll have to look okay. up and see. And what's the second one? Uh, uh, the other thing, uh, don't the universal universalist or whatever it is, uh, don't they worship trees and rocks and things like that? I've read some of their literature. I don't, and it's you know, wild. I don't know much about the universalist uh, theology. I know that they accept all different forms of understanding that God's spirit is everywhere. That and the idea of trees and rocks and having a spirit of life almost sounds uh, more like the natives. You know, but I, I, I went to a, a Native American recently and talked to him about that. And he said his understanding, uh, he was in a worship service. He said, is not, he said, we just as a people, see that, that the rocks and the trees all have a breath of life that God has given to them, but only God is the Savior and the, and the salvation. He said, I know that when you see TV shows about Indians, <laughs> he said, you, it looks like we're talking to trees, talking to rocks, and that they, they are God. He said, our understanding, and it's just his faith, is not that, that they're God, but they do have a life spirit, that there's something alive in everything but not the same thing as God. There's only one God. And I thought that was a great description for myself trying to understand that. Who has the microphone there? Oh, Adele. For one thing, I'm getting thoroughly confused, but mm -hmm. I was looking up in, in Proverbs, mm -hmm. and it talks about wisdom and so forth, and that God shows his wisdom, but if we refuse to follow his wisdom, we cannot be saved. Okay. So everyone that is shown... I don't understand now, how. I don't think they're disagreeing with that. Uh, yeah, how? The thing is, if, if you were shown the gospel of Jesus Christ, I mean, that's between God and you, whether you comprehend it, but if you were shown that and you rejected that, the scriptures are very clear that there's no hope for you, I mean, in our understanding. But what we're speaking of tonight, Adele, is what about somebody that's never shown and that their only light is that they come out in the morning and they see the sunshine and they say, wow, there must be a God. You see what I mean? They have nothing, and then they die. Our understanding of a just God, would God say, well, no missionary ever took Jesus to you, so you've got to go to hell. Sorry. You see what I mean? That, that's right. the idea. And again, that's just being wimpy, again, just trying to say that's, that's our justice. But is that the justice of God? I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. Holly back there. She's just itching to get that microphone. <laughs> go ahead, Holly. I have two things. Okay. First of all, uh, in Romans uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 12, it says, There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all mm -hmm. and richly blesses all who call on him. 
for everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I always thought that we had to uh, call on Jesus mm -hmm. for his grace and his forgiveness. Right. Um, this seems to be saying that uh, all you have to do is, is call on the name of the Lord and you're saved. Well, I think the, uh, the, if you look at the context, Paul's definitely talking about the Lord Jesus. I mean, I understand what you're saying, you. that if you were just reading that abstractly, you would think, well, that, you know, Islam's God is their Lord. But if you look at his context, uh, again, he is referring specifically to Christ. Ray, before you share, Holly said she had, well, I mean, Beverly, wait just a second. Didn't you say you had two, two points? Let her, I'm sorry, Bev. Pull that microphone away from you. Go ahead and make your second comment. <laughs> well, if this is true, that if you can call on the name of the Lord, well, the Muslims have their own Lord. Yes. They call Allah. Yes. So if they call on their Allah, uh, it's a Lord. And I, right, I see what you you're know, saying. So do you see where so I'm going with yes, this? Yes, I do. And so, again, if you went back to my original question, can a devout Islamic, then you could say, well, they're being, and that's part of the universalist concept, is that if you're devout in any of your faiths, then you're all, where they're just different journeys all to heaven. And Christianity teaches against that. I mean, Christianity is an exclusive religion in the idea that the perfect picture of God is Jesus. And so if you deny Jesus, but again, uh, it goes back, we're, we're kind of separating that. It's not denying Jesus. It's the idea of maybe never hearing of Jesus, right? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Beverly. Thank you. Uh, I think it's in the book of John, but somewhere in the Bible, it says that Jesus lighteth every man that comes into the world. Yes. So they're without excuse. So yes. I'm not sure from our discussion where that would be the Holy Spirit, but they have light of Jesus. And that's what I, what I stand on. When you say the people who've never heard of him, they will have heard... It, because the Bible says that Jesus lighteth every man that comes into the world. Right. And we don't know how maybe that's done, but I believe the Bible that, you know, they can either say yay or nay. Okay, I, I, I agree. I, I'm just not sure. I'm like you. I'm not sure how that's done. You know, I picture in my mind Jesus, every person facing the judgment seat of Christ, I picture Jesus being there, and I picture Jesus, let's say Fran, let's say I'm Jesus and Fran there. I look at Fran's heart. I mean, I can look at everything that's happened in Fran's life, past, present, what's made Fran to be Fran, and I see her heart, and I know what kind of person she is. Now, is not a synonym of Jesus agape love? Uh, it, you know, some of those basic understanding, is that not a synonym of Jesus? So does Fran have agape love? You know, maybe she doesn't have the strong agape love that, that Beverly, you have, because you know Jesus and the joy of the Lord. Maybe she doesn't know that. But does she have any inkling of agape love? Has she made any choice of selflessness instead of selfishness? You know, instead of going with, like Steve said, her own works, staying away from idolatry. I just know there's something more. I just don't know what it is. You know, maybe Jesus then looks at that and just says, you know, Fran, you know, even though you didn't know my name, you knew me. You knew agape love. You knew those kind. I don't know. I mean, I'm glad he's the judge. There's no doubt again, and we'll just keep emphasizing it as it was lifted up. Let's don't ever take away that the way to the gospel is Jesus Christ. That's the way to salvation. That's your ticket. But again, what about those around the world that don't seem to have even the opportunity to have that ticket, you know? Right? Uh, yeah, I think about creation. You're talking about the, the believers. Of the, if you had to, that was God's doing. He made a creation. Mm -hmm. He made it good for all of us. Yes. Even the persons there. Right. If they worship God at that time, even Moses worshiped God. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not in the picture. How would how would that to me, if you worship God and you did what was necessary to please God, then they should have that same ability without seeing Jesus or the Holy Spirit. It's a, it, the Holy Spirit is Jesus as well. See, and God as well. Remember, it, the Jesus we see is the Jesus of humanity. But remember, if the Trinity is true, then Jesus and the Holy Spirit are, the, are, the, are one, and so is Jesus and God. So back then when they saw God, and that's all they saw, and that would speak to people today as well. That's interesting the way you said that then that is Jesus, even though they don't know it's Jesus. Moses didn't know that was Jesus. John? Yes. I uh, thought I've always been a good Christian, but um, I was 
baptized and confirmed in a church. I went to church every Sunday I possibly could. Right. And um, I was on the council in the church in Pontiac, Michigan, mm -hmm. and the Lord had to come to me. And he came to me in a very, very strong visual form and said, John, you're trying to walk the middle of the road with me. You wow. cannot do that. Wow. You're either here with me or you're Amen. over there with Amen. the devil. Amen. And I said, okay. okay, Lord, watch my smoke. So then I began to... <laughs> I began to try to work my way into heaven. Oh, that happened so many times, and John, then, it does. Yeah, yes. and then in March of 1987, when I came to Florida, I went to a women's and men's uh, retreat in right. Crystal River, mm -hmm. and the Lord had to come to me a second, second time, time while I was there. And he said, John, he says, you have to accept me as your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. I said, thank you, Lord Jesus. And I moved over into the co-pilot seat. Ah. And he <laughs> has been my pilot ever since. But once go. in a while, I jump in that jump seat in there and, and try to pull get it off aside. course. Oh, gosh, that's but good. But the, the Lord has been very good to me, amen. and I don't deserve it. Amen, amen. I think for all of us, that's a great testimony. Who do we have, Fran? Oh, Lorna, yes, ma'am. Clear us up, Lorna. Oh, don't muddy the waters. You Go know, ahead. many, many, many times when I was coming up, um, I would think about the babies that died before they had any understanding or right. ability to understand. And um, other people that would not have a chance to know Jesus. And Jesus died and went to heaven was buried for three days right. i always believed that he was down there proclaiming the gospel yes to all of those that had yes i believe that too and that was just a warm fuzzy yes me. exactly you know saying that lorna spoke to me in a way though you know if jesus is the one that we believe he is the one who loves us the one who would be willing to die on the cross think of this now for our sins to give us all for you and me. I mean, just that terrible agony on the old rugged cross. Don't you think that he loves people in far Asia? <laughs> you know, where people are, all, he, he's God. He put them all over there from, from the Tower of Babel. And he knows that they are not, they don't have the Christian movement like we do in the United States of America. Don't you think he loves them just as much as he loves us? And he's trying to reveal himself to them. He is wanting us to send missionaries. There's no doubt. But there's not that many obviously going to all those places or not allowed to go to those places, you know. So doesn't it make kind of sense that he's judging, he's looking at them at their heart, trying to judge them maybe on what they know and not what they don't know, maybe, you know. Now, do they need Jesus? Yes. Once you have Jesus, when you die, you know, I mean, there's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. If you know Jesus right now, that's your life. That's your happiness. That's your joy. That's, that's everything to you. That is your salvation. Your salvation isn't when you die. Your salvation is right now in Jesus. The peace and joy and love and comfort, encouragement and grace and all of that right now. So that is the answer, you know. Uh, how does that answer get to people that maybe never knew it? And, and talking about muddy in the waters, what about people that have heard it, but let's say their parent they found out, you know, their parent uh, preached the gospel. I've heard this a number of times, you know, or this concept, preached the gospel, and yet when they went home, they abused their children. So it's very hard for that child growing up to believe in the Jesus that that man proclaimed. I remember years ago getting gas at a gas station coming down from Kentucky to see my mom and daddy when I was in school up there, and I stopped at a gas station one time in the break of day right outside of Atlanta, and this woman saw me. I still had my suit on. I don't know why. That seems so stupid now. I still had my suit on, you know, at 5 a.m. in the morning, drove all night long from Kentucky. And so when I was getting up there to get gas, the lady looked at me and she said, you're a preacher. I said, well, how do you know? And it's, it's Monday morning. She said, you have your suit. You need to... And I said, are you, you know much about preachers? She said, my husband was one. And I said, oh, really? I said, where? And she said, she said, where'd you come from? I said, Kentucky. She said, well, we were in the Louisville Seminary. It was a Baptist seminary. And she said, but my husband left with another woman, just like that. And I said, really? I said, I'm so sorry. 
I said, I hope that didn't take away your faith. She said, it did. Now, well, God, you know, I mean, God loves that woman, but in her mind, this Jesus thing messed her up. You see what I mean? I, I would not want to be her judge, but Jesus will be her judge. He'll, you know, he'll take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. Where's the microphone at? Steve, go ahead. Yes, sir. Well, the Bible says that the law of God is written on all men's hearts. Yes. You know, so they, they know the truth, at least in, you know, not, not full light form, but they have the truth of God's law written on their hearts. They know they're ethically accountable to God, and they know that they miserably failed God. Mm -hmm. So men can take one of two responses. They can cry out and say, Lord, you know, I'm unworthy, which is the right response. Right. I'm unworthy. You know, I can't, I can't work my way out of this. Or they can take the other response, which is the response of all the other world religions. And this, you can work your way out of this. You can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Good point. You can make this happen. So I'm not trying to say that, you know, the door is open to everybody to come in because if men take that, you know, I can make this, I can make it happen, I can yes. do this, that is the way to condemnation. That is a way of rebellion. That yeah, is a way, way of rebellion. It's the way of rebellion, exactly. Now, people in the Old Testament did not know the name of Jesus. I mean, all the saints in the That's Old Testament did yes. not know Jesus' name. You know, and the Bible makes it very clear that we who live in the New Testament are in a much more privileged position because we live this side of the cross. We, we're very blessed versus the saints in the Old Testament. Right, You right. know, to, to be on this side of the cross yes. is a wonderful thing. And just in, in disagreement with some of the comments that have been made, I don't see as I read Scripture that there is, you know, a second chance in the afterlife. I've not seen that oh, in, in the, the Bible. So I'd have to disagree with that concept. Yeah. I don't and think you, she meant, Steve, in the, in the, I don't think you meant in the afterlife. I think you meant in this world a second chance, didn't you? Not sure. Okay, well, you research that and give it yeah. to us next week. Go so I, don't, I just don't, yeah. I mean, I've studied, I've studied this. I've studied all the literature, you know, a lot of literature on this subject, and I just don't see it. I've read a lot of different books on it. You're not a fan it. of purgatory I, then, I don't guess. No, <laughs> no, no purgatory. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's... I just don't see a second chance in Scripture. I think this is, you know, the world where we need to be saved. But yes. again, you know, what about the infants who die in infancy and never experience, you know, having exactly. a will, you know? Exactly. And there's where God can intervene and save them. They're, they don't have an opportunity to even respond exactly. or not respond. And I don't know if any of us would, and maybe we would, but I'm not sure if any of us would disagree. If you're going to be black and white, an infant did not ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins, they're lost. If you're going to be black and white about it. So I, I think that we l use reasoning. That's a good part of the Methodist, you know. Steve, but you, you know let's un do brand universalism dog. is the idea that everyone is going to be saved, that there is none who are lost. Okay. And there are the Unitarian Universalist Church denies the Trinity. That's why they're Unitarian. And they're universalists because they say everybody's going to be saved. And the most consistent universalists say even Satan and the demons will be saved. Serious? And, wow. And, I, you know, I've argued with universalists. And, you know, do they, they believe, may I ask before we leave that, uh, that would be a good topic to even for another session. Do they believe there's any kind of punishment for, like, Hitler? I mean, you know, or, or anything, or I'm not even sure whether, th if, do they have a theology Well, that's on a that good question. Most, of the, most Unitarians are very liberal. They don't even believe in demons. They don't even believe oh. in Satan. But those few that do, I've even pressed them and said, do you think that even the demons and Satan are going to be saved? Yes. You know, okay. I'm like, no, <laughs> no. Go ahead. Let's have a closing thought. Brad and Dot. I remember a few years ago when the Israelis were into a little bit of problem with Syria, mm -hmm. and they dropped a bomb across the line and killed seven children, and the world was upset about it. Mm -hmm. And there was quite a few people that I heard talking about, how could God let that happen? Yeah. And my answer to them was, these were young children. They're dead. They'll go to heaven. Mm -hmm. But if they grew up to be Muslims, I don't think they'd make it. That's, that is one of the, I, it's funny you'd say that way, Brad, and that might be a good part to lift up next week too, because I thought about that. If you, if, you, if you hold to that concept, 
for eternity, it'd be better if we all died in infancy, you know, because many of us make wrong choices. Many of our children, you know, when we're praying and praying and praying for our children and we feel like they're straying away from God, does that mean then if they had just died when they were infants, at least they're going to heaven? That, you know, that sounds weird. So that would be a good discussion, though, you know, to, to kind of wrestle through it. You know, because people wonder about that. That's one thing that keeps people away from God sometimes. They said it just doesn't make any sense to them. Dot, give us a closing comment. Well, I was in, in Romans um, chapter 11. And I, while I realize that this is basically talking about uh, the Gentiles and the Jews, mm-hmm. um, it says branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, Mm -hmm. sternness to those that fell, but kindness to you, provided that you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Amen. That's a wonderful word of encouragement. You can be grafted in. And that might even go, again, surely to the idea of a second. In this world, before we die, we may have second, third, fourth chances. I mean, opportunities, many times God given us to draw close to him. We do, we do. Who's that? According to who it is. Oh, I was afraid it was Linda. I was going to say, no, I want Linda's. <laughs> Linda's got, a, maybe have some dessert. I'm going to just Linda. Go ahead, Adele. I just, I just have a question, and, and I, I've wondered about this for ages because I had Jewish friends in school. Since they don't believe in Jesus, but they do believe in God, does that mean they will or won't be saved? I mean, they think there's still somebody coming to save them. Yes. So I, I don't understand. I know I got into numerous arguments back sure. in seventh grade, but I, I just don't understand. Can you explain it? I sure can, and the ant- You know, we just ran out of time. The answer is very obvious, but we ran out of time. Actually, let's start with that. The Jews. Are the Jews going to heaven next week? We'll just pick up with this and move on through the discussion. That'll be a good one. Are the Jews, Orthodox Jews, going to heaven? Father, we love you so much tonight. Thank you so much for being here in this room. What a great discussion. Lord, I know that uh, sometimes we may leave here. Some of you probably in the spirit of prayer are saying, I'm more confused than I am having answers tonight. That's okay right now. And I know that's not a comfortable place. That's not warm and fuzzy. But we're just, we're working through something. You know, when you're, when, you're, when you're lifting weights, when you're exercising, you're straining those muscles a little bit, they're a little sore. They hurt a little bit. That's okay in your theological growth. Let's, it's all right to struggle a little bit. It's not like God's going to punish us for wondering and questioning and saying, God, I just don't understand this. It, I think God loves this. I really do. I think God loves our inquiring of him, focusing on him. So Holy Spirit, bring us back together next week where we start with the uh, Judaic faith. Will they, since the revelation is Jesus Christ, well, what if they die still looking for a Jesus? And they see our Jesus. What's going to happen? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And may all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. Have a marvelous evening. SBRC behind the sanctuary.